So we are delighted. We are delighted to have as our first speaker Stan Voiger, who received his PhD in economics from Harvard University, is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and the editor of the American, uh, the American Enterprise Institute Economic Perspectives. His research areas are political economy and public finance. Voyager also writes frequently for general audiences on topics including healthcare policy, tax policy, US politics, European politics, and popular culture. Voyager is a regular contributor to the National Interest in US News and World Report. He serves as a board member at the Altius Society and as the chairman of the Washington DC chapter of the Netherlands America Foundation. So Stan, thank you very much. We're looking forward to your talk. Uh, well, good morning. Thank you all for coming. Mark and Scott, thank you uh, so much for inviting me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk today about the Flategate. Um, it's been in the news a lot this year. You may uh, know at least some uh, of the basics, but I'm going to quickly walk through the uh, events as they uh, unfolded this year, if I can get my clicker to work. Oh, I can just do it like this. Ah, much better. Um, so I uh, grew up in the Netherlands. I don't really know anything about football. I barely know what punting means. Um, so for people like me in my situation, I'm going to uh, quickly walk you through what happened in, uh, in the Flegate. So in January, in Foxborough, the, Indiana, the Indianapolis Colts and uh, the New England Patriots uh, played the uh, AFC championship game. That's almost the final of the NFL. Um, the Colts and the NFL after the game and even during the game accused the Patriots of cheating. Supposedly what the uh, Patriots did was they deflated their, uh, the footballs they were going to be playing with before the start of the game to give Tom Brady, the Patriots quarterback, a better grip on those, on those footballs. Um, initial media reports suggested that uh, 11 of these 12 footballs were 2.0 pounds per square inch below minimum. I don't know what that means, but that's a measure of pressure. So I'm going to use that as the unit uh, in you know, most, of my, uh, most of my presentation. Uh, I don't think what matters is that the footballs are supposed to be between 11.5 uh, and 13.5 uh, PSI. So two is a lot compared to uh, you know, those numbers. Um, after this accusation, a pretty drawn out disciplinary and legal and media storm uh, ensued uh, with, uh, according to basically the following timeline. So you have this championship game that, as you can tell, the, the Pats won, you know, with a lot of difficulty and reached, you know, because they had those deflated footballs. Uh, a few months later, the uh, investigation ordered by the NFL uh, concluded with the uh, release of the Welsh report. The report is named after its, its lead author, uh, attorney uh, Ted Wells. A few days later, uh, Roger Goodell, the NFL commission, uh, commissioner, punished Brady and the Patriots. The Patriots accepted their uh, punishment. Brady appealed. There was a 10-hour appeal hearing uh, the next month that uh, at least one of the attendees today attended. It was in a basement bunker, a very small room. Um, and uh, a month later, Goodell decided to uphold the sanctions that he himself had uh, imposed a, a couple of months earlier. Um, the, Bra the Brady and the NFL Players Association appealed that uh, decision to uphold the uh, punishment in the sort of NFL internal disciplinary uh, process. And in early September, a federal judge vacated the uh, uh, sanctions against Brady. Um, now the NFL is appealing again, and then, you know, around 2024, uh, this, after the Supreme Court has, has uh, granted cert, uh, Justice Scalia will probably descend from a Supreme Court 5-4 to four decision <laughs> vacating these sanctions forever. <laughs> the, um, this is a little timeline to show sort of interest, the interest that the people showed, you know, the original events drew a lot of attention, the punishment drew a lot of attention, and then the, the appeals process draw, drew a lot of attention. As you can tell, that attention is very evenly spread over the entire, over the entire world. It's not at all something that only people in, um, in New England are obsessed with. Um, so, you know, this should be a good general interest talk. Um, so here, the Welsh report is what I'm going to discuss. That's the, as I said, the result of the investigation the NFL ordered. Um, 
it was, I'm putting independent in quotation marks here because that's what the federal judge who vacated the sanctions against Brady did as well. Um, it was a report written by uh, uh, basically a law firm that hired a scientific consulting firm to help out with some of the details. What the report found is that Tom Brady was at least generally aware of what was deemed to be more probable than not illicit behavior. Uh, the combination of those two, uh, I think, were meant to translate to uh, the, the, stand, the evidentiary standard of preponderance of the evidence was met. Um, so this, this finding is based on a bunch of experimental, statistical, and other uh, circumstantial evidence, including uh, uh, text messages about weight loss and other uh, issues. The, um, what I'm going to focus on here is the, the, you know, because this is a symposium on statistics, is the statistical part of the, of the report. And the, uh, the, I guess the objective of the statistical analysis in the report uh, is uh, supposedly to figure out whether the Patriots footballs were indeed deflated beyond the point that you would expect based on, you know, just gameplay and temperature differences and, and things like that. So uh, there's only one step, of course, in the report because, you know, they were, were they more deflated than we would expect? The report says yes, but then the report also tries to, uh, you know, present a series of events that shows that it was the Patriots uh, who did that. Um, the core of the, of the statistical analysis in the report is, is a difference in difference uh, estimator using drops in deflation for the Colts and the Patriots between pregame measurements and halftime measurements. Um, so basically, you know, here's a little, it's, a, it's an OLS estimate of the equation I'm showing you here, which is, you know, there's a pressure drop for uh, a bunch of, a pressure drop measured for a bunch of footballs. Um, and we have one explanatory variable, which is a dummy for is it a Patriots football or is it a Colts football? Um, the report uses more uh, elaborate uh, notation for this, but this is the actual analysis they carry out. Now, this seems straightforward enough. The problem is that the data quality is, is, is pretty terrible, and there's a lot of additional uh, assumptions that the uh, report has to make to be able to, to produce estimates here. Um, so here, here are the data. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk about why uh, uh, why I'm somewhat suspicious of the quality of these data. So what you see is there's 11 Patriots footballs that were measured at halftime, uh, and four, Col four Colts footballs. They were measured by two officials, you know, sitting next to each other, and they produced the, the readings here. Um, now what you may not immediately see is that the uh, measurements by uh, official Priolo are higher than those made by Blakeman for the Patriots footballs. They are lower for measurements made for the Colts footballs. Um, how did that happen? <coughs> well, we don't know. 20 people in the room, and, they, uh, and no one seems to remember whether these two officials switched the gauges they were using to measure footballs in between measuring the two footballs. Even more, no one seems to remember whether after measuring the Patriots footballs, they reinflated them before proceeding to measure the Colts footballs. Um, so one of the things that the report tries to look at is what if we assume that they did switch gauges in between teams? How does that affect our estimates? Another thing they do is they say, oh, but that third Colts football is out of line. The, the, the Priolo measurement is higher than the Blakeman measurement, and according to the switch that we just assumed, that shouldn't happen. So what if we assume that they jotted that number down in the wrong column? And then the fourth assumption they make is, what if we just drop that one observation? Um, the, so, you know, that's, I mean, there's only, I mean, there's, there's, there's only 15 footballs here that were measured twice, and that's the number of just simple data measurement uh, assumptions they have to make. But there's a bunch of other sources of uncertainty here. So what I showed you just now were halftime measurements. Th those were at least jotted down. Uh, supposedly, there were also pre-game measurements. For, for those measurements, the report relies entirely on the recollection of uh, the umpire, who says, look, I measured them all. Every single one of the Patriots balls measured in at 12.5. All of the Colts footballs measured in at 13.0 or 13.1. Um, that's, that's very little variation in those measurements, if, especially if you look at uh, the variation here. Um, so, you know, that's 
I would say that's problematic, but we're going to, for, mo for, mo for the most part, rely on that recollection. The umpire also has a recollection of what gauge he used before the game. The Welsh report says, no, that's not the gauge you used. I'm going to see how the results depend on whether, gauge, what, what, whether he used, uh, w what gauge he used for what, for what team. Um, then at halftime, as I just discussed, we don't know what gauges were used per se. We don't know. The record keeping is problematic. Importantly, we also don't know exactly when the measurements were made during halftime. This is important because these footballs were brought out from the miserable cold that it's Boston in January to a comfortable locker room. And as that happens, the, uh, the pressure on the footballs gradually uh, returns to, to its uh, original measurements. Um, then after the game, uh, when, you know, they we're measuring these footballs. Everything, I think, is considered unreliable by the Wells report because post-game measurements are all at like 13 and 14. And I'm going to discuss how that affects our ability to produce reliable <laughs> estimates. Uh, in addition, there was uh, the Colts intercepted a football during the first half. That's why there's 11 footballs here in the data center staff 12. They measured the pressure of that football as well. The Wells report doesn't use that data, but I will. Um, so let's look first at what the Wells report does to deal with the different uh, renditions of the data set. So as I discussed earlier, you can either assume guy one used gauge one all the time guy, and for, for the Patriots footballs and then switched when he went to the Colts footballs, and guy two did the, did the opposite thing. The logos are called the logo gauge and the non-logo gauge because one has a, a, a logo, the other one doesn't. The logo gauge, importantly, measures 0.3 to 0.4 PSI higher than the other one. Um, and then, you know, the other three are the assumptions I discussed earlier. So what do we see? We find here, if you run that simple uh, uh, diff and diff estimation, you see that there is a positive coefficient on the, um, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the dummy for the Patriots. And the way I've, you know, defined positive and negative, that means that the Patriots footballs were indeed more deflated uh, than you would expect by 0.7 PSI. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that result is pretty uh, robust to the four different renditions of the data set at half time. So that's good, you know, so far so good. But there's more uncertainty. So we don't know what gauge we used before the game by the umpire. The umpire has a, rec has a recollection, but the Welsh report says, no, but based on what we think happened, that doesn't fit the data. So they, in uh, all of their estimates, assume that he used the uh, non-logo gauge before the game. I'm going to show you what happens if you, uh, if you consider the possibility that he used the logo, game, uh, for, the logo gauge for either one of the two teams or for both teams. Uh, that's, his, uh, that's his recollection. Um, so uh, here we have these different estimates. And as you see, the significance level for, for gauge scenario three that is, he used the non-logo gauge for the Colts, logo gauge, that's the higher one uh, for the Patriots. The, the, the uh, coefficient on the Patriots dummy is no longer uh, significant at the confidence levels that the report uses. Uh, why is that? Well, simply the logo gauge is higher. So if you assume that that one was used for the Patriots footballs before the game and you're correct for that, then the uh, deflation that you have to explain becomes smaller. Um, so that's problematic, but still, you know, you say there's four possible scenarios. The gauge switch is, you know, unlikely, even though it's what happened during halftime. Um, but, you know, this, this is how it goes. I'm also assuming here that the uh, cold footballs were measured at 13.1 before, before the game. Um, but again, I want to emphasize how, how strange it is to, to assume that this umpire has a laser sharp recollection of every measurement he made before the game, but no idea of what gauge he used. Um, different source of uncertainty, we don't know what, at, when exactly different footballs were, were measured. So I'm gonna, there's different ways to control for that. I'm gonna do a, simply, a simple parametric control where I add in um, count, order variables for, for the two teams. So there's here, we have CPI, uh, that's the Patriots ball number, basically. So this goes from 1 to 11, um, and uh, CCI, which is the, the Colts ball number, uh, which runs from 1 to 4. Uh, because even though the report is not certain whether the Colts balls were measured at the end of halftime or before the, the Patriots uh, footballs were reinflated, it does uh, explain that the uh, officials ran out of time measuring all of the Colts footballs. 
which, you know, would suggest that Colts footballs were indeed measured at the end of halftime, um, making timing even more important because more time would have passed between the last uh, Patriots footballs and the, and the, and the first uh, Colts football. What happens if you do that? You throw in these timing controls, and uh, suddenly, uh, the, depending on what gauge scenario you use, the uh, results become uh, even less significant, and the coefficient on uh, the Patriots dummy uh, becomes uh, smaller. So here, the um, you know, so this is problem. This 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 shows you how non-robust the results are. Right? I throw in what I think is a pretty reasonable timing, uh, a set of timing controls, and you know, the, you can't say anything anymore. Not weird because we only have 30 observations here, and and presumably a lot of measurement error. Um, during the appeals hearing, the, uh, the, uh, the guys in charge of writing the Welsh report said, well, look, but these time and controls are not significant, so we throw them out. You know, I mean, that's, that's not how omitted variable bias works. Also, you know, they're, they're not significant, but they, you know, neither are the patriots. <laughs> what are you going to do? The, um, more problematically, the coefficient on the, uh, on the time and controls goes in the opposite direction of what you would expect. So the later, the footballs that were measured later are actually less, uh, were actually more deflated than the footballs that were measured first. So they say, okay, that means that the timing controls are, are wrong. You can also say, look, it means that we can't say anything because no one argues that the, no one argues that the Colts footballs were somehow treated illicitly between pregame measurement and half-game measurement, and then there's no way to explain that, you know, that positive coefficient on the timing control. Um, then the second to last uh, source of uncertainty uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out here is that after the game, you know, as you would want to do, because instead of using the Colts footballs as a control, why not use Patriots footballs during the second half as a control, right? You could replicate the experience from the first half, reinflate them up to 12.5, uh, see what the, uh, what the pressure level after the game is, right? That allows you to run a much, much cleaner uh, diff and diff. Um, the uh, report says, well, you know, we can't do that because we don't really know what happened after the game. This is, so this is a, a sign of a, I think, a broader problem with this whole procedure, which is that there was no protocol in place. <clears throat> and, um, you know, they were just, they were doing everything on the fly, which is, you know, fine, but I don't think, but I think makes it harder to, to draw firm conclusions and makes it less fair to impose severe punishments. So what happened after the, what happened, uh, after the game? Um, unclear, even the report itself says that the data can teach us anything, and the measurements are actually really high, which is weird, but you know, who knows, maybe they put the footballs in a microwave before they, you know. We don't, we don't, we don't really know. Um, and the last thing I want to discuss is the, 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 the football that the uh, Colts intercepted during the first half. So that one was measured three times. Um, the, oh, hold on, let me, so that was measured three times. The average uh, air pressure was 11.52. That is remarkably exactly what you would expect based on the experimental analysis in the Welsh report. So they say if you start out at 12.5, then just because of the temperature differences and, you know, the rain and stuff like that, you know, physics, I, I don't know. The, well, you would expect the football to measure between 11.32 and 11.52. It measures in it exactly 11.52, so I'd say, you know, case closed. These, this football was intercepted by the Colts, so you'd expect that, you know, if anything, they would try to deflate a little more. Um, but, you know, this one comes in ex exactly as expected. Interestingly, this football is measured three times, and the different measurements are 0.4 PSI apart from each other, which is massive because that's, you know, basically the same um, uh, amount of pressure difference that, that the whole debate is about. Right, so the, the size of the measurement error is, basic, is the same order of magnitude as the size of the, of the crime, uh, which, is, which is worrisome. Now, there's a, there's a simple way to confirm whether this, is, uh, whether this, this intercepted football is special or, or representative. Because what we can do is we can just discard the whole Colts footballs as, as a control uh, business and just take simple differences for the Patriots footballs, right? They were measured before the game, they were measured at halftime. We don't have to deal with all the timing, you know, problems if we just look only at the Patriots footballs. 
So as I said, the expected range for the Patriots football is at halftime is 11.32 to 11.52. If you assume that before the game they were measured using the non-logo gauge, then the excess deflation, the footballs would come in at around 11.12, uh, are not significant at the confidence levels that the Welsh report adopts. If you assume the logo gauge is used before the game, then there is no excess deflation. So this is a very simple interpretation of the data we have. Um, the, referee, the umpire used the gauge that he remembered using before the game. Uh, nothing illicit happened. And at halftime, uh, football is measured in at exactly the level um, that you would expect based on temperature differences and the like. Uh, surprisingly, the, the Welsh report never does this test, even though it seems like the obvious first thing you do, right? You, you want to know the Patriots footballs were, you know, excessively deflated. You look at, you know, the deflation of the Patriots footballs, but that's not in there. Instead, they use their diff and diff estimator throughout. So that brings me to my uh, conclusions, which, first of all, I think that the, you know, the, the central finding of the statistical analysis in the Wells report is uh, not at all robust to, you know, different specifications, different assumptions about uh, the way things uh, were measured or recorded. Um, I think, secondly, that the, the assumptions they draw, the, the conclusions they draw from their analysis depend very heavily on, on, on a prior that's basically, you know, you say, okay, 50% chance they're guilty, 50% they're not guilty. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of, of deflation under certain scenarios, so preponderance of the evidence says he's guilty. I don't think that's the typical prior we adopt in disciplinary procedures. It's certainly not the typical prior that the legal system adopts. Um, if you uh, take seriously the tests that they, uh, uh, that they themselves propose, where you say, you know, null hypothesis is not guilty, we need 95% confidence to overturn that, then I think you can't say that um, uh, the finding is what they claim it is. And, you know, a lot of I mean, a lot of these weaknesses are driven by the fact that there was no protocol in place, I think, at the day of the game. I think everyone recognizes that, uh, that the NFL was not ready to, to, to record measurements. They didn't, I don't think they realized that timing was, was important. Um, and, you know, so much went wrong with the data collection that I don't think uh, this statistical analysis added much to the disciplinary procedures. Um, yet it became a central uh, uh, piece of it, and I think it, uh, I don't know, it shows, <laughs> it shows you two things, that, you know, you can use statistical analysis to prove your point in very cunning ways, because, you know, people say, oh, well, they did statistics, it must be true. Um, it also, uh, it also shows you, um, I think that if you're going to carry out uh, severe punishments, you should probably have the rules and procedures in place uh, beforehand, which the NFL did not have in this case. And on that note, I'm going to conclude, because, uh, Otherwise, uh, Carl is going to be mad at me for eating up his time. There you go. All right. We do have time for a few questions if, uh, if anyone has any. Uh, we're going to give you the mic, so this is all being video recorded. Interesting presentation. I uh, don't have a question, but I've got a comment. It stuns me that the NFL lets the teams handle the balls. Can you think of any other sport where the object you play with is handled by the teams and manipulated? Uh, uh, boxing? <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Where? Oh, back here. John. John. Thank you for the presentation, sir. Could you comment on the present way the NFL has proposed to measure such balls? Uh, I, I don't know enough about the the physics of it all. I would admit, I mean, but it, at the same time, this is not super complicated, right? You just record when do you measure the footballs, what level they measure in at, what gauge do you use? Um, you know, that seems fairly straightforward for uh, an organization the size of the NFL. Okay, we have time for one more. 
Sheldon Jacobson, University of Illinois. Uh, were the names of the statisticians who did the analysis for the uh, NFL revealed? It would be kind of interesting to know how they would stand behind what they did. Well, so, uh, yes, they were. Uh, you, can, you can actually read more about their view. There's a transcript that was released of the 10-hour the uh, appeal hearing, uh, and, and a, a couple of them testify in that hearing. Um, and, but, you know, I mean, they're very defensive of the analysis they did. Um, they don't explain, for example, why they don't, why they never did a, you know, simple differences analysis. They actually claim that they never used the Colts as a control group, which is a weird claim because, you know, because they did. Um, <laughs> they, I, 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 tried to, I tried to address their, their concern about the timing controls. Um, but, you know, I mean, at the same time, it's, it's, they were, they were handed a pretty tough job because I think the data and the other information they were given was just not good enough to produce any kind of solid conclusions, yet they were expected to produce solid conclusions. Uh, you know, so I, you know, I wouldn't blame them too much. One should take that assignment and they got paid well, you know. <laughs> Let's thank the speaker once more.